The pictures from the tsunami that hit Asia on December 26th are so devastating, they take your breath away. The number of those who died has already exceeded 150,000. It all started with a massive earthquake in the Indian Ocean that measured 9.0 on the Richter scale. Now we've seen these images, but what really happened when the waves hit land? To take us inside a disaster like this, Dr. John Clegg is a tsunami expert at Simon Fraser University, he joins me from Vancouver. So Dr. Clegg, how does the size of this disaster, this tsunami, compare with ones that we know about from the past? This is as large as they get historically. We've had about three or four earthquakes of this magnitude in the last century that have produced tsunamis of this size. Uh, the waves at distant locations can be up to 10 meters high, which is uh, extraordinary. There were people that were killed 5,000 kilometers from the epicenter of this earthquake by the tsunami itself. Now, uh, just, just quickly, uh, Dr. Clegg, is it, was this simply a case of the earth, the, or sorry, the floor of the ocean rising with the earthquake causing a kind of swell at the surface of the ocean and then it spreads? Well, it, it's, don't think of it as a surface wave. It is a wave that's embedded in the total ocean. It's true that the seafloor jerked upwards during this earthquake and acted like a piston to generate this wave, but the wave is it moves across the surface, but it's also moving across the full depth of the ocean. Oh. And so now what happens when that full depth wave reaches land? It begins to decelerate because the wave begins to encounter the friction or the bed of the ocean. And uh, the waves begin to pull together and they grow in elevation or in height. And uh, the energy then is, as the water shallows, is propagated in an inland, inland surge. You get this total mass of energy being propelled inland in a turbulent, highly energetic surge. So Dr. Clegg, what would people uh, standing on the beach watching this approach have seen? Well, the first thing is they would have seen the water withdraw. Uh, that's the leading edge of the first wave as the water does this extraordinarily withdrawal. Uh, but that's immediately followed by the first surge, which is a wave, normally it's a, it's a turbulent cresting wave, not a typical Hawaiian type surfer wave, but a, just an onward surge of water. Um, in some protected bays, you can actually get cresting waves that are 15 meters high. So more of a wall of water than a wave? A wall of water that becomes highly turbulent in shallow water and can surge inland up to kilometers. There's an instance in uh, Sumatra where a boat was moved four kilometers inland. So what determines how far inland it's going to go? Largely the slope of the land. If the land is all very sh close to sea level and the slope is gentle, it can travel long distances. If you have a steeply dipping near shore area, the, the water will not travel that far inland. How do success, there are successive waves to that first one, right? How do they compare with the first one? In this case, as in many historic examples, it's the second or third wave that's the largest. I believe it was the third wave in this train that was the largest in Indonesia, which is quite typical. Uh, is there, what's the explanation for that, that the third wave is the biggest? Uh, I guess, well, it's a little hard to say. It, it's a, a series of waves and, and much of the energy is not captured in the tails, but rather in the kind of the middle wave of this train. Now much of the destruction obviously that we've seen is on land, uh, but I've also heard that scuba divers who were underwater really didn't feel a huge amount. What about people who were on boats in the ocean? In the open ocean, in deep water, you wouldn't even know that the tsunami had moved past, and it travels at the speed that a jet airliner travels. Uh, but in shallow water, as the water gets shallower, the effects become more pronounced. Um, and in very near shore areas, if you were swimming a short distance offshore, you would have been swept inland by this tsunami. Now, the, so the waves go inland, as you say, depending on the slope of the land. Is it dangerous to be in the way when the, that water recedes back to the ocean? Absolutely. Uh, the water, of course, ebbs. It reaches its high point and then begins to ebb. And all that water escapes back to sea. And it will carry objects and debris, of course, people with it. And commonly, people are injured seriously injured by the incoming waves only be just swept out to sea and then drowned. 
If you are swept out to sea, is there any chance of surviving? Well, if you're a good swimmer and uh, you, you're a long distance from the shore at that point, so it's very difficult. Uh, you may be injured. Um, you would have to, you'd have to get to shore, and of course, there is this likelihood of additional waves following shortly after that. It's hard to imagine the power these things have, isn't it? It's incredible. You can't think of them as normal storm waves, which are surficial waves in the oceans. These things are quite a different phenomenon. Thanks very much for this, Dr. Clegg. My pleasure. John Clegg is